Welcome everybody. My name is Stacy Parker and I am a Gateways Horticulturist with the UC Davis Arboretum and Public Garden. Um, happy Pollinator Week. I am here to talk to you today about some of the care that you might want to take for your hookeras. Um, if you have hookeras, that's a very common plant that we suggest for shade and I have a shade garden. Some of you may have actually seen my, oh, thank you, that's nice. Somebody put in a few little um, bees. Jill, thank you, in honor of uh, Pollinator Week. I wanna remind everybody, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to put them in the comments. I'll try my best. Hello from Windsor, oh, wonderful. Um, so it's gonna be a hot one today, so luckily we have the shade of the morning and the cooler weather. So um, <clears throat> some of you may be familiar with my um, garden because it was featured years ago. I believe in 2014, I um, sheet mulched my front yard and um, I actually transformed it into a garden um, with drought tolerant plants and we have kept a Flickr album and also some resources, including a plant list on the website. Um, so you can find that there if that's helpful. But what I, I'll start by showing you this today. Okay, so it has filled in substantially. I'm just gonna do some panning. You'll see a ladder there with an oscillator on top because I'm gonna to talk to you about my summer watering techniques because we don't have um, irrigation in here, automatic irrigation. And so <clears throat> part of my plan is to actually share with you my strategy around how we go about that. So I'm gonna take you through. Um, you can see I've got a couple of containers out here with straight sides and I'll come back to that because that's what I'm going to talk to you about with respect to the oscillating watering and knowing that you're getting enough watering enough water so um, you can see I've got an array of plants I've got salvia spathacea it's looking a little bit tired like I could uh, cut it back to the ground over there. Um, and then I have these really, I have this big drift um, of sedum palmeri. So both of those are Arboretum All-Stars. I did actually plant quite a few Arboretum All-Stars here. And the sedum has really done well and it makes a nice little color block and it kind of brightens things up because it's a light colored green and in the shade it's nice to have um, lighter colored plants to brighten things up and then you'll see uh, here this is a big block of heuchera and i had heuchera rosadas and that was the number one plant that i bought when i um, when i redid my lawn and these, these flower stalks are now spent. They have been blooming for months and they were this really pretty little fuzzy um, like mass of pink for uh, since April, I think. And then they sort of died down here in June. And this is kind of the first time that I start thinking about deadheading. And typically it's good to have a buddy if you have as many as I do. I have about 30 plants out here. That's, the, that's uh, what I got the most of, like I said. And the way that I designed them is that I put them out in, a, in these big clusters or what we call, we refer to as drifts. And the reason why I did that is because it's a naturalistic way of planting because typically you don't see in nature one plant all by itself. Um, it typically because of, you know, like how they propagate themselves and everything, you'll see them in clusters and repeated. 
and it makes for some nice cohesion to repeat and also have a nice drift is uh, the term and I'll just this is a different view here in the foreground you'll see um, some iris canyon snow this is one of our favorites it's also an arboretum all-star it has spent blossoms on it as well it was um, it was blooming with these beautiful white iris blossoms earlier in the in the springtime <clears throat> so um, what you'll see is that I have repeated the hookahs on this side of the path and that's also one of those techniques for designing a naturalistic garden is to have the drift continue across the pathway because usually it makes you feel a little bit more balanced. Now I don't have the same number and that's um, intentional because uh, when you actually repeat and have full symmetry on both sides um, in, in even numbers, that um, denotes some kind of formality and um, that's not what I was going for. You'll also notice in looking at these hookahs, they are suffering a little bit here. Um, they've got brown, crispy leaves. This is called necrosis. If you wanna impress your gardening friends, or maybe we've got some smart gardeners here that already uh, know these terms. Anyway, um, <clears throat> basically this patch during the middle of the day gets direct sun and it gets blasted sun and unfortunately um, as a result it has been not doing so well so I'm gradually moving them into a, um, a shadier location over here I've got a little drift that's over here and this this little one in the foreground and this one over here I just um, moved those these this spring so they're not as full as these other ones um, but you can see I'm kind of going with the same theme is just create a nice massing uh, so that you have that feeling that of cohesion and it's a little bit more naturalistic you might also see growing up in um, my hookahs, I have an Aristolochia vine, which is a pipe vine, a California pipe vine, also a California native. I didn't mention that about the hookahs, but they're California natives. Um, we highly recommend them for dry shade. And um, it's twining up there. The neat thing about this plant is that it's associated with the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly and the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly will lay its eggs on this plant and the caterpillars will eat will hatch out and um, eat the leaves and um, it's just a wonderful plant and it's nice knowing that you're supporting local pollinators and um, which is the theme of this week and uh, so anyway without further ado I'm going to show you how I deadhead my hookara. And um, basically I don't use any tools, I just use my hands. And what I do is I take one of these stalks and I follow it all the way down to where, let's see if I can get the camera in there, to where it attaches at the base of the plant. And normally I don't look, I'm just trying to show you. Um, I usually just feel and then I push down and it comes off. You can see right there, that's called the abscission zone. So it'll break off nice and cleanly and, um, and that's one. And then you just find them, follow them down, push it down with your finger. And then once again, there's the end you'll get the next one. I'm telling you, my mom used to live here in town and I would invite her over when it was time 
to deadhead the hookahs because it takes a long time and you don't always you know like this one broke but I still ended up getting the end which is nice and when they have dried down this much the nice thing is is that they come off pretty easily so I just go around the plant and keep um, taking them off follow you follow it down sometimes okay this one didn't quite come off in the abscission zone so that's okay it's just the main thing that you don't want is what I call pretzel sticks and anybody who works with me as a volunteer out in the arboretum knows that I don't like what I call pretzel sticks and that would be if I we're trying to deadhead this plant, and instead I came along and just topped them like that. And I don't like that look of those little sticks sticking up. And, um, and so I think that this is a much cleaner look to the plant. Then you don't have to see that stuff dying back. And um, it's a nice little meditative activity. So for if you have as big of a drift as I do, what I recommend is doing this in a couple of stages because, um, you know, like a couple of sessions because it'll take me quite a while. But, um, you know, you just kind of get through. Now, inevitably, what ends up happening is um, you don't get... You don't get the, um, the flower stock just right. And instead, what comes off is you break off a big piece of stem. Oh, Andy Cod. Um, <laughs> you call them hat racks. Okay, so I've got a comment from Andy Cod. He says that he calls them hat racks, but that's a, re that's a really good one. Um, what we do... If you accidentally break off a big piece of your, while you're doing your deadheading, so, so I get careless and maybe a little bit lazy for a while, like after doing this for a while, and inevitably a whole stem will come off. And last year, after doing all of these plants, I had about 15 I did that about like 10 or 15 times. And what I do is I save those stems and I'm gonna keep on deadheading, see if this just actually happens um, while I'm talking to you. And what, what happens if, if, that, if I do accidentally break off a big piece of the plant, that can turn into another plant. And the way that that is, is it's, it's a cutting. And, um, I'm not sure how many of you, maybe I can ask you, how many of you have done cuttings before? Maybe give little thumbs ups or something like that to indicate whether or not you've done cuttings. Anybody? I know Andy has for sure. He is a master cuttings guy. Cuttings are a type of propagation where you take a piece of the plant. Oh, I'm getting some thumbs up. Okay, good. Um, you take a piece of the plant and it's the above ground piece of the plant. Generally, you can do a root cuttings, but I'm going to, um, talk about using, um, stems. You take a piece of a stem and what you do is you put a portion of that stem below the soil and it'll send out roots. It re, it does this thing called it uh, dissociates um, and instead of being stem cells, you trick it into creating root cells. So I'm not, I'm doing such a good job here. I'm not breaking off any stems accidentally. So I might have to do it on purpose in order just to show you all. But last year I had those, um, I had uh, those 
you know, like 10 to 15 plants. And what I did is I just put them in a trash bag and I gave them to my friend. And these are Hookara rosadas. And when you take cuttings of Hookara rosadas, you end up getting the identical plant. So that's how they're propagated and that's how you get new ones. Um, so I essentially gave her what ended up being, being um, you know, about a dozen new Hookara rosada plants that she got to have free of charge. It just takes a little bit of time and patience and then she can have the identical plants. And so this is, um, you know, like genetically an, a clone. It's identical. Okay, so this is working so well that I haven't broken any off. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to just get rough and I'm going to actually break this off. So you can see. So this sometimes happens when I get too rambunctious and um, I, uh, you know, like accidentally break off part of the stem. So this is what I'm going to root. And you can see that there's like another little baby even right on here, a little baby plant. So I can even make that a separate one if I would like. I can just, oh, sorry, with the camera work here. I can break that one off. If I set this in some potting soil, this will send out roots from the bottom. This one will, and this is a teeny one, but this whole thing will as well. And um, in terms of prepping it to put it into some potting soil, I would just sort of clean up some of the base Oh, sorry about the camera work. I'm doing this one-handed. <clears throat> um, clean up the base of these leaves. And I'm just gonna push, push some of them off to remove them. And in doing so, I'm going to remove some of the surface area that this, that this um, cutting is going to lose moisture. Because I'm gonna cut down on some of that surface area because it no longer has roots, obviously. To, we want it to make roots. It has no, no longer has roots in order to take up water. And so what I don't want is for all of these leaves to, um, to basically just be these vehicles for losing a lot of, um, a lot of that moisture. So I'm trying to make it a little bit more compact and I'm doing that by breaking it off just like I was deadheading really because I'm breaking it off at that abscission zone okay now this let me show you this is a pretty good cutting I actually I, I still feel like this is too much so there um, I can now stick this, this stem part, oopsie, this stem part here, you can stick this in some potting soil and just keep it watered and this will, um, this will eventually root and you can give it to your friends. So I'm going to pick up some of my leaves, all my debris here. So we've learned how, how to deadhead kukuras and we've also learned how to propagate them. So I'm gonna walk over and I'm going to show you how to stick these cuttings because I already have a pot of potting soil. And the reason why I'm gonna use potting soil, some things you can do this straight into your soil but sometimes that's a little bit rich and it's prone to rotting that way. Whereas potting soil is very light and, um, and porous. Okay, here's my big pot of potting soil. It's very 
light and porous. If I pour water in here, it's not going to puddle. It's going to go straight through. So that's how I know that it's, um, it's very coarse. And whereas field soil, you know, like what, what I have underneath here, which is just the native soil, that is very fine particles. It's very dense. If I started pouring water onto here, it would puddle pretty quickly and I would have to wait for the water to keep penetrating. You can see it's dry. It's because I'm getting ready to actually irrigate, which we're going to go over that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to finish with um, the cuttings and talking about the difference between, so there are some things, particularly succulents, that would be fine with you actually putting them into the soil directly as a cutting and then finding, making roots out in the garden. But I recommend, especially for beginners, it's a good idea to go with potting soil or you can also do something that's like, um, a mixture of vermiculite and perlite, if you know what those things are. Um, they, they're often in potting soils and um, they're inert and they drain water very, very readily. You can get them at your local hardware store. Um, but again, for beginners, I just recommend some nice coarse potting soil. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna stick this in right to there. I'm going to keep this portion up here um, unburied because um, that's where I have new leaves coming out and this is my cutting. It's all That's all done and that's ready to go. All I need to do is keep this watered. Now the thing is is that I'm going to put this um, in the shady spot. I don't want to I don't want to stress it out by putting it in the sun not only because this is a shade loving plant but also because um, in general cuttings do better in somewhat shady conditions we're trying to tell the plant that it's time to make roots and as such shade actually helps with that um, i'm going to have to water this pretty frequently as i said before this doesn't have roots to be taking up water. So all I need to be doing is watering probably every day. And um, the re that's, that's part of the reason why it's really nice to have this coarse material is because I'm not going to, I'm not as prone to overwatering and rotting this thing because I have to water it so often so that it doesn't lose um, its moisture. Now, I'm going to also tell you this is not the most ideal time of year to be taking cuttings. The reason why I do it this time of year is because I accidentally end up breaking off so many pieces and you still can do it this time of year, but I would say it's preferable to do this in springtime when the, when the plant is really pushing if, um, out brand new growth and but before it started, um, it started flowering. I would do it well, well before it's starting to flower. That's the most ideal time. Okay, so we've done cuttings, we've done deadheading. Now I'm going to talk about um, how I water my garden. Um, there are so many different ways to, to water a garden. And like I said, you can see here this, my field soil here is very dry. And you also can see that I pulled back quite a bit of mulch. I have a lot of mulch on here because it helps um, retain the moisture. And so I had, I put a thick layer of mulch. I called this company, this online, no, 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 I didn't call, sorry. I actually, um, it's not a company, it's, it's online, it's called Chip Drop. You can get mulch chips from tree services delivered to your house for free. The big problem is is that, that you have to be willing to accept about 20 yards, which is a huge amount. Um, I think my yard total probably took about eight and it was like in the backyard and also in my alley as well. So it's, a, it's quite a bit. Um, and it's a lot of work too. I mean, make sure you have a wheelbarrow and hopefully a friend. Um, 
But the nice thing is, is that my neighbors, I know that I have a lot of gardening neighbors and um, it's a really nice resource to share with your neighbors because they can mulch all of their, you know, their street trees and um, in their gardens too. So, um, so anyway, I highly recommend Chip Drop and they haven't paid me or anything. I was thinking about that earlier and with me and gardening and I can't help it but endorse certain things. But that seems to be a very helpful way of, of getting mulch in a low cost way. Of course, you can um, purchase it as well, but um, it quickly adds up because of, uh, you know, the cost of things. And you're helping to divert resources, you know, from maybe not the landfill, maybe they still, maybe they compost it, but still. It's, it's very good for retaining moisture and um, providing habitat. There's, there's many, many benefits of mulch. Okay, so watering. I do not have a, um, an, an automatic irrigation system. Instead, what I have is an oscillator. And this oscillator here is set up and ready to go. Um, I've got I've got this little valve here, which is kind of nice, so that I can just turn this on and off here, and I can test it and see um, where it's going. And um, in terms of figuring out how how much water to put on here, we water this this front yard once every two weeks. Um, and that's, that's kind of pushing it. You can see my soil is quite dry, but I have these very drought tolerant plants that are accustomed to dry conditions so I can get away with it. Now, um, I'm gonna tell you that basically in the summer in Davis, we lose about, um, let's see, about a 15th of an, a 15th of an inch to about a third of an inch of, of um, evapotranspiration of inches of water per day. So that's out of the soil, that's what's evaporating out of the soil, and then it's also being taken up by the plants and let up into the air. So if on average, it's about a quarter of an inch a day. And um, if, you, if you were to put that all back, that would mean that you're you're watering a quarter of an inch of water per day. Now, we have drought tolerant plants here and that measurement of evapotranspiration and that quarter of an inch, that refers to what um, a water thirsty lawn would require. So we actually um, use that as a, it's a reference um, evapotranspiration rate and instead of and and so if you put in something that's drought tolerant it takes about a quarter of what that thirsty lawn does so we lose if, if you if you add that up it's about um it's almost two inches a week for that thirsty lawn or eight you know like roughly eight inches of water per month so if I am only if I have drought tolerant plants and I am only replacing about a quarter of that because I don't have a thirsty lawn, I have these drought tolerant plants. That means that I'm putting down two inches of water per month. That's my goal. So hopefully that's, that's helping to break that down. I can review that if you all would like. But that's basically it. I'm putting back one quarter of what is left from evaporation and transpiration. Evaporation from the soil, transpiration is what is taken up and lost from the plants. Okay, so if I am putting down two inches per month and I'm watering once every two weeks, that means that I'm putting down about one inch of water each time I water. Now I have to move my oscillator around a whole bunch in order to get everywhere. And you can see out in my lawn, I have three different containers. There's one 
Here's another. And here's a third. Okay, the thing that these containers have in common is that they don't have the same volume. They're not the same size. None of that matters. What matters about these three different containers is that they all have straight sides. So that is, with straight sides, if I turn on this oscillator and I start running, oops, this oscillator. Hi, Karen. If I start running this oscillator, <clears throat> what I do is I come back and I see how long does it take for me to fill these different vessels with one inch. And it'll take, you know, like it'll take some time and it depends, it, it changes based upon your water pressure, how big of an area you're having this oscillator go, um, you know, like if it's going straight up and down, if it's going to both sides, in this case, it's only doing, it's only going one direction. So it'll take some time. And these different buckets are going to be hit differently just based on all of those different factors that I said. So basically, if I wanna make sure that I get a full inch of irrigation down, I go and I look at these and if one is a little bit over an inch, I just don't want any of, the, of my vessels to be less than one inch. It's like when, one of the, when all three vessels have a minimum of one inch, I have, I have accomplished this, this area. And um, it's almost like doing an irrigation audit. So you can still do this, the same um, thing with your overhead irrigation. You can't do this with drip. With drip, uh, you have to do it, you have to do the calculations in a different fashion. But this is the identical way that you would go about doing what would be called an irrigation audit in order to determine how long you need to be running your irrigation. So, okay, so a couple of minutes ago when I was talking about mulch, thank you, Maggie, I hope you're still there, um, for your question. Maggie asks, is there a mulch that is less likely to be disturbed with a blower? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think what um, the ones that, so I don't, like I haven't actually purchased much mulch. What you'll find from my gardening is I am such a scavenger and that's why I was talking up chip drop, drop and you know beggars can't be choosers so I'm one of those types of people. Um, that said, there have been a couple of times that we've had grants at the Arboretum and I've actually gotten to purchase mulch in those instances and um, the we call it's called walk on bark mulch now the thing about bark mulch is that it's not as good to have a lot of bark in your mulch compared to it being actual wood chips so um, sometimes they call things bark mulch and they actually are wood chips um, and sometimes they're actually just you know mulches that are made from just bark the thing about bark is that it's not as nutritious for, um, let's see, it's not as nutritious for the plants and it doesn't have all of those wonderful properties of um, organic, you know, like organic matter decomposition and stuff like that. It's made of a different substance and, you know, like this is trying to, this is bringing me back. I don't remember exactly what the... It's like, it's like cellulose instead of lignans or something like that. Now, don't quote me because I wasn't prepared to go that deep. But basically, um, I would say something that has more wood chips in it is going to be a little bit heavier. Um, some people like Gorilla Mulch because it kind of, um, it's a little furry and it'll stick together a little bit more. I like that Gorilla Mulch if you're doing like a slope because otherwise stuff will just slide right off whereas the gorilla hair 
um, sort of is a little bit more intertwining. And as a result, it creates a little bit of a network and maybe it doesn't, it doesn't slide as well. But in terms of being up for a blower, that's a tough question. I think, I hope that that helps to answer. I'd say definitely go for something that has wood chips in it and hopefully that, that, that helps with that. So, all right, so we, we've talked about mulch. We've talked about um, knowing how much water to put down in the summer in your, um, in your landscape. Obviously, if it's hotter, that evapotranspiration, I was telling you what it tends to do on average here in Davis. And so that's, you know, like that's a pretty good indicator. However, um, you know, like people, you can also look at a website to be more accurate. And all of the UC Davis Arboretum and Public Gardens irrigation systems on campus are actually tied to um, the, what they call these SIMIS stations that actually do that determination. And you can even do that um, at your home. If you get a professional irrigation system installed, it can be tied to. So you, you end up putting in like a base rate and then it adjusts from there. So it'll be like, oh yeah, this needs to run for 14 minutes if it's, you know, like if, if the evapotranspiration rate is X and then it adjusts and it knows to tack on extra minutes when it's been extra windy and extra hot because of these weather stations. So that's a little bit more advanced, but this, so I'm not, I, I don't have that, but I'm still explaining the whole principles hopefully to you so that it sort of demystifies the, the, the larger experience, you know, like the larger, sorry, understanding that you would have for the concept of what we're, what we're hoping to accomplish is we're just trying to put back the water that was lost because hopefully you are starting with it. And that's why we're doing like really uh, deep watering too, is because if you do really shallow watering, then your, then your water isn't penetrating. And from what I, from what I hear, if you put down an inch of water, it usually penetrates at least to um, like a foot's depth. And, um, and basically the water, you probably still have quite a bit of water, uh, still in your soil down below that. And so we're putting all of that stuff back and then, and then the roots don't come up to the surface. One of the troubles that people had a few years ago when we did a lot of lawn conversions is people had, um, larger trees growing in the middle of lawns. And as I said earlier, with how much you have to water a lawn and how frequently you have to water a lawn, all of that water was happening, you know, like multiple times a week, most likely to keep a, a, a nice thirsty lawn, really lush and green and beautiful. You have to do that several times a week. And um, if you're doing that several times a week, the water stays up at the top and it never gets down into those lower la layers. And with trees, when people took out their lawns and then they had their trees, the thing is, is that those trees adapted to the water being in the soil surface in that, in just that root zone of where the um, lawn was. And so they created their root architecture. So think of, you know, like their roots did not go down for water that wasn't there. Their roots um, were, you know, like designed to capture that water in the soil surface. So then it's a real, it's a much trickier endeavor then to, to, cause it'll take years for you to um, support your tree in such a way that it can go to these lower depths and, um, and take less time, you know, you can, you can decrease the frequency of the irrigating. Okay. So, wow, I've just been just rattling off so much. I hope I haven't bored you all too much. Um, if there's any other questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I think I've covered what I set out to cover, which is deadheading hookahs, which we have three different kinds of hookahs that we um, list as Arboretum All-Stars. Hookah rosadas are just one, but um, the native alum 
root is island alum root is another that's hucura maxima and then we also the cultivar lillian's pink is another one that we highly recommend so one has white flowers that island alum root which is so pretty and we have a really nice drift of it in the mary Wattis brown garden if you've um if you've been to the mary Wattis brown garden in the arboretum in the springtime there's just a just the prettiest um, drift of them and actually that was my inspiration for my front yard initially so anyway that's three arboretum all-stars here right in front of me i've got another couple this one here is a japanese holly fern and they just give a lot of texture and depth and they've got that nice green so I'm not doing anything super wild and crazy here. I'm just trying to go with what we recommend. I've got that sedum palmeri. We've got the hookahs. Um, I've got this the hummingbird sage. Let's go check out. See, we're getting some water in there. Hopefully you can see. I don't want to get my phone wet. So when it comes back, let's see. I got to pull back just a little bit. Whoa. Okay. Here we go. But you can see I've already accumulated probably about a quarter of an inch. So, oh good, I've got another question. We have a large maple that nearly died from lack of water when we got rid of our lawn. We put a deep vertical pipe in and every two weeks we deeply water into it to save the tree. Oh, yay! Oh my gosh, wow, that's a great suggestion. See, Jill was a very responsible um, gardener and didn't kill her tree and looked after it and figured out how to take good care of it. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jill. That's wonderful. So um, hopefully, I think I've been t talking now for <laughs> over 40 minutes. So um, these are some of the tips that I have for summer watering, summer deadheading, and a little bit of bonus propagation when you when uh, you can turn some lemons into some lemonade thank you all so much for tuning in i hope you're enjoying your gardens as much as i am during this time and um thank you also there's going to be a nice special that you might want to check out on uh, this this thursday's garden gnomes is going to have our very own Gateways Horticulturist Rachel Davis, and she's going to be talking about pollinators, and um, and she's doing all kinds of postings this week around pollinators and the importance of pollinators, because there is this effort afoot that a lot of conservation um, priorities could be met if we as home gardeners helped out, if we all teamed up and helped out, we could do a lot in terms of um, doing our part in making homes and habitats for our very important pollinators. So she's going to be talking about that. So tune in this Thursday. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Jill and many others for tuning in. I really have enjoyed talking to you all today. And I hope that you are having Oh, it's happy summer. This is the this is um, officially summer. So take good care and we'll see you again sometime. All right. Take care. Bye.